Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be back. In the name of the Lord. Just a little horse to start with. <clears throat> but uh, Lord lets me get in second gear after a while. <clears throat> so I've been speaking much this week at the meeting. And there have been a lot of questions to be answered. And then go out of the building hot. And it, uh, I have no bad cold. And I never felt any better in my life. So I just feel fine, but my throat just overtaxed. And uh, it'll be all right. So I um, want to thank each and every one of you for all that you have done. I tried to find, as I drove up a few minutes ago, Billy and some of them was on the outside, trying to find the little family that had come down and gotten broke and couldn't go back. If they're still in the building, I wish some they'd hold up their hand or something. I, I wanted something on that myself. And so the little family that from Michigan or somewhere that uh, run out of gasoline or something or money. If, you, if you're still here in the town, if you see them after the meeting, pass them by my house. I want something in that. I, that's what that's what we're here for, is to give a helping hand to anybody we can. So now, the Lord Jesus bless us is our prayer. Now, <clears throat> this has been an unusual week, and we've had some unusual things. But I'll say that I have never seen a time that the Holy Spirit ever moved any freer than it has this week in this service. It's been just perfectly wonderful to me. And at night time when I go in, sometimes it's one o'clock in the morning before I can go to sleep. I just rejoice in the thoughts of the Lord Jesus being so good to us. Hallelujah. And now, I, any of you people that's around here in the city, or neighborhooding around that doesn't have a home yet, church home, you're welcome here to come anytime and make this your home. Remember, we don't have no membership here, just fellowship for all. We don't have, as Howard Cadle used to say, no law but love, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. And so you're always welcome at the, this little tabernacle which we're expecting, if the Lord willing, soon as we can, to build a better church, more, more substantial place, not too big, for we believe Jesus is coming soon. And we don't want no too elaborate thing. We just want something. This one's about to fall in. It served its purpose. And we're very thankful for it. I'll never forget right where this pulpit stands now. About 20-something years ago, I knelt in an old pond and at horse weeds over my head, and the Lord said, build your church here. On a little lot that we went to the Ingrams and got it for $160 if we'd fill it up. This was an ice pond where we all skated. Brother Jeff Spencer ought to remember this was a pond in here. Him and Sister Spencer, I guess you remember. They used to bring the teams up and drive way around this way to keep them getting into the pond. I was a little boy over here at Ingerville School. This was a pond. We got here in ice skating and play shinny and everything else on the pond. Brother Mike, you remember when this was a pond? Yes, sir. Uh, Brother Roy back there. And now where the pond stood, we just got part of it left. That's right behind here. <laughs> That's where we baptized the people into the water for remissions of their sins. And now, this, you know, when you bring questions down, and where you, you've got something that you want to present, and it's a problem because you've got a mixed audience. People have been taught one way or the other. But when you can explain the thing, even contrary to what they've been taught, and the sweetness of their spirit flow back, that's godly to me. I don't want to bring any certain name, but a, 
a certain doctor from out of the city just met me in the room in there. A medical doctor, I suppose. And he said, for years he had been so, uh, kind of tangled up in that. He read a book that was wrote concerning it, contrary to what I was teaching. But said, since he's been sitting in the meeting and seen the facts of the Scripture placed, it settled it forever. Uh, a while ago I met in a room with some people from uh, out of the city, from Illinois. And there's about four ministers, three or four ministers. And they said, Brother Branham, we have taught the contrary all our life. But we catch the vision now and see what really is the truth. We've been wondering what it was. And, and now, that see, that is that we are now just what it is, brother. Don't think that that degrades any church or any people. That only brings the church up. Thing. And then together, we must stand. We must stand together. When those, when God divided Himself at Pentecost, breaking up the pillar of fire into little bitty pillars of fire, and went and hung over the people, and the Holy Spirit come on them. If God divided Himself among us, every time one adds His self to us, that accumulates more around that pillar all the time. And together, when it's all the great ransom church of God is drawn together, we'll take a trip through the skies just as certain as anything. Amen. I've never tried to separate or sow discord among brethren. I've tried my best to be just as kind as I could to understand and, and other men. If they, churches who sponsor my meetings, then if they are they're different with one another, but they love me. And they'll sponsor my meetings and I'd come in among their people. I certainly wouldn't say one thing. A, a gentleman wouldn't do that, let alone a Christian. Certainly not. And then if I ever have tent meetings, which I'm figuring on doing the Lord willing someday, then I, I will, before I teach anything of these teachings, First will be morning services with the pastors for several days. Let them know what I'm fixing to teach. And then if that brother doesn't see it and doesn't agree any brother, then let them take their congregation and say, now, I don't want you to hear this. We'll just stay away while they're teaching that thing and give them the privilege. We always want to be in harmony with God and with His children, with everyone. So now I've got a question to answer tonight. The Lord willing, and I thought maybe I'd answer this question just before. I, I thought I had another here, but it was a dream that someone had given and wanted me to pray over it and give the interpretation, which the Lord has been so gracious to us to do that so many times. Now, we want you to know before we start in the service that you're all cordially invited back to every meeting, every time that we have one, and from Louisville, from out of town, from in the city and the roundabout, these fine ministers, the brother from Sellersburg, the singers, that lady, ever who she was, singing out here a while ago, and the little fella, we just thank you so much. I, I was talking with some brethren back there, and I didn't even get a chance to see who it was and what it was, but I, I certainly heard it. And it was beautiful, and I certainly appreciate that effort. Now, well, I missed this last night. My son put it in my pocket. Some precious person had wrote it. And now remember, these questions are not to be different. Sometimes maybe when they're wrote, they sound like they're different, but it's an honest heart trying to find out. See, that's the way we always approach it. Some real honest person trying to find out what is right now. Here's some time ago. I was down to a home having a prayer meeting. And Brother Junior Jackson, I heard him a while ago, or I thought I did. Um, he was with me, and he had got through speaking, and there was a minister from another church. And no more than I'd hardly gotten to the floor, he jumped up and started wanting to fuss with me. Well, there happened to be about five ministers there, and they was all going to climb onto the man at once. I said, no, don't do that. Now, he, he challenged me 
So let he and I talk it over. Well, he started off, we speak where the Bible speaks, silent words, silent, and so forth, and away they went. And just in a few moments, I kept marking down the scriptures he was misquoting, misplacing, said there wasn't but, there wasn't but twelve people ever did receive the Holy Ghost, and that was the apostles. And uh, divine healing was only given to those twelve, and so forth. So you see, you just miss the mark by a million miles. So after the, after I, after about a half hour of him speaking, I asked him, and he said I was the devil. And so then after it got you speaking, I said, now first thing I want to say, brother, I forgive you for that because you didn't mean that. I know you didn't. For if you're a minister and I'm a minister, we should be brothers. And then I said, now to misunderstand each other in the scripture is something different. So then we begin to take the scripture. And the poor fellow was so lost in the minute he didn't know where to stand or what to do. Then he got so tied up he didn't know what to do. And he, when he walked out of the building all that night, he said, I'll say one thing, Brother Branham. You have the Spirit of Christ. See? And I thought, the devil a few minutes ago and now the Spirit of Christ. It's only the way you approach it. And so, Christ is not to fuss. <laughs> now, now the man... Because that he did that, horrible things happened to him. Almost lost his mind from an institution or something, jumped out of a window and almost killed himself. And now he's coming back to some good friends of mine. He's seeking every day the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Wants to come up to my house. I have hands laid on him to receive the Holy Ghost, a preacher of a great denominational church. See? So honest heartedly. We answer questions with all that we know how to answer. And now, I'll read this question. Nicely written. Brother Branham, would you please explain why the people in Acts 2 and 4 spoke in other tongues or languages even before the multitude came together in Acts 2 and 6? That's the first question. It's the same person, I suppose. Also, yes, it is the same person. Well, now... If you will notice, brother, sister, ever who it was that wrote it, it never said a word about them coming downstairs from upstairs. And the audience was not upstairs. But when they come down into the courts where the multitude was gathered, that's when they heard them speak in tongues. See? See? Now, you could say, well, they did speak up there. And if it was a debate or a fuss, you'd have just as much right to say they did not speak to the guy down here because when this was noised abroad. Now, other thing here, it goes right with it. Would you explain how Simon knew the Holy Ghost had been given in Acts 8, uh, 18? That's at Samaria. Well, there's one thing. He didn't know they had the Holy Ghost because of speaking in tongues of the Bible didn't say they did. They just seen the result. No one can receive the Holy Ghost without being something happening to them. That's right. But it didn't say they spoke in tongues there, so it must have been something else that he saw besides speaking in tongues. Because it never mentioned them speaking in tongues. And explain how did we know some of the people on the day of Pentecost spoke Galilean. They're the biggest part of them there was Galilean. And all of them. Now, as I said this morning, now there is two things, two faculties. Now I'm going to take the side that the people was speaking in tongues. The people speaking not in tongues but in languages when they come out of the upper room and begin to meet the people. But if you read the scripture, listen close now. Are not all these Galileans which speak and how hear we, how hear we ever man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Are not all these Galileans that speaks? They could have been speaking Galilean, but they were hearing them in another language. It could have been they were speaking another language, their own language. Either way, wouldn't matter. It still doesn't make the Pentecostal conception right. See? 
Because, listen, here's why. Not to say something different, but just to make a fact straight. If you notice, why did Peter get up then and speak to the whole multitude and they ever one heard him in the language he was speaking? For 3,000 was converted of staunch Jews who were just as staunch in their religion as they could be, but they must have stood, understood every word of Peter preaching on the prophets and so forth, bringing up to Pentecost. For they screamed out and said, Man and brethren, what can we do to be saved? Peter said, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of your sins. Now, just let me say this with, with the, all my heart so that you'll see that I, what I'm trying to get to you. I certainly do believe in speaking in tongues. I believe that it is a gift to the church. I believe that there is a tongue... I've spoken tongues set many times myself. Let me give you a little instance what I think Pentecost was, and then I'll uh, something like it, uh, or something on this order. I was in Dallas, Te Houston, Texas, just before this picture was taken. About one day, we could have the music hall. We was holding eight thousand. The people couldn't get in, so we went over. To Raymond Rich's tabernacle, I forget just it was a mammoth big tabernacle, and and we feel that full, and I'd preach and pray for the sick here. Then while they put them out, I go over and preach and pray for them over here at Raymond Rich's across the river. And then when we was over there fixing to come back to the music hall, I Howard had just let me go as far as I could go, and he touched me on the shoulder, patted me on the side. If you notice in the room, when the anointing is on, they'll pat me like this. That means it's time to quit. Don't say no more. Come on. And Howard used to be, I'd stand there, he'd just get my hand, throw me over his shoulder and walk on out. Because right? he knows I just had enough. Well, I started to leave the platform when he patted me. I said, okay, brother. Started to leave the platform, and a little girl, little girl was sitting, standing here crying. Little Mexican girl looked to be about 12, 14 years old, just teenage. And I looked at her, and I said, what's the matter, honey? I said, she's crying, Howard. I said, you've had enough. you got another group over there waiting. And uh, I said, bring her up here. And I just reached over in motion like that, and she come up on the platform. I believe Brother Woods and them was present. Now, they was at the meeting. I don't know whether at that time or not. Brother Woods, where are you at tonight? Was you, is that right? Yeah, he was there. And um, I said, bring her up on the platform. Well, I said, look, honey. Do you believe that God is able to tell me what your trouble is? And she just kept her little head then. Well, I thought maybe she may be deaf and dumb. So I looked again. I seen it with speech. And I said, oh, she can't speak English. She couldn't speak one word of English. So she was from Mexico. So they had uh, an interpreter to come. And I said, do you believe, honey, that the Lord Jesus can tell me what your trouble is. Well, she spoke back to the interpreter and said, Yes, she believed it. And I said, Can't you speak English at all? And the interpreter said to her, She said, No, she never wrote any words of English. She was from Mexico. And so when I, then the vision started. And I said, They don't interpret the vision, you see, because you're speaking constantly. Never interpret a vision. So until it's all over. And then they tell them what happened. So then while I was... I started to speak. I saw a vision. I said, I see a little girl about six years old. She's got on a scotch plaid dress with black strips of hair hanging down her back and bows of ribbon in it. She's sitting by an old-fashioned fireplace. There's a large kittle and she's eating yellow corn from it. She eats so much corn till she becomes violently ill. She falls and her mother lays her on the bed and she has epileptic fits. And that's what happened to her, see? I said, you've had epilepsy ever since. And quickly, before anyone said anything, she looked up to the interpreter. She said to, in her own language, I thought he couldn't speak Spanish. And the interpreter said, did you speak Spanish? I said, no, sir. I spoke English. He said, well, she said you spoke Spanish. I caught it. 
I said, stop the recorders, this big bunch of recorders, maybe 30 of them going. In them days, oh, Brother Roy Roberson, wasn't you there? Uh, yes, Brother Roy Roberson, and Sister Roberson then was there. So I, I said, stop the recorders, play it back. And it was actually in English. But you see, then when I started, as long as the vision was going on, I was speaking English, but she was hearing it in Spanish. How hear we ever men in our own tongue, wherein we were born, see? And, but as soon as I started speaking myself, then she didn't hear a thing that I said. But while the inspiration was on, now, apply that to Pentecost just once, see? Uh, uh, friend, God's my judge. The Holy Spirit did that. Now let's pile that back to Pentecost for our need. The Holy Spirit wouldn't do anything just just to say He did it. It's got to be a cause and a reason. See? Now, on the how hear we ever man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Are not all of these speaking Galileans? How do they know they were Galileans if they wasn't speaking Galileans? They all dressed alike. How do they know they were Galileans? Are not all these that speaking Galileans? And how do we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Then up gets another man of Galileans, Peter, and begin to preach to them. And somehow or another, in that multitude of people, 3,000 souls understood him and came and was converted and gave their lives to Christ. Now listen, let me just take you one more scripture, please. Let us go over to the great Saint Paul. And then we'll read the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians and then drop into the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians when Paul's talking about if the ears will say to the nose, I have no need of you and so forth, the members of the body. Then in the 13th, 13th chapter, listen what he says now. Now we know that there's two different kinds of tongues mentioned in the Bible. One of them is a language that it's, it's a dialect of the earth. Now the other is an unknown tongue. Now many of my most precious people, I've told you I'm Pentecost. Now most of my people believe that that uh, when they receive the Holy Ghost, they just uh, get up and speak in an unknown tongue. That's exactly contrary to the Scripture. Amen. Amen. Then the people don't know what they're saying. But on the day of Pentecost, everyone knew what they were saying. Amen. That was a going forth to every nation. See, Jesus said the gospel must be preached to all the world beginning at Jerusalem. There's word had to be that way. Now, Notice, Paul said that one tongue, that if you spoke in it, the unknown tongue, which is the gift of tongues, unless it be by interpretation or by revelation, that it wouldn't profit much. And then we find out that in the 13th chapter, he said, though I speak with tongues of man, that's dialects of the earth, or of angels, though I speak with tongue of man or of angels, and have not charity, I'm nothing. So you could speak with both genuine tongues of man and angels, and still you haven't got the Holy Ghost. Did not we just have it in Hebrews 6? The rain fell upon the wheat and the weeds. Didn't Jesus say the rain comes on the just and the unjust? See, the same rain that makes the wheat grow is the same rain that makes the but by the fruit of that you know it. And the first fruit of the Spirit is love. What Paul said, if I have, if I have all, can speak in all kinds of tongues and have not love, long suffering, gentleness, faith, patience, and so forth, it profit me nothing. See? And then notice about gifts. You say, oh, there's a great man of God. Oh, he performs miracles. That still don't make him right. Though I have a gift of miracles, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, something on that order, though I have faith that I can move mountains and not have that fruits of the Spirit, love, I'm still nothing. 
thing. Because faith will do anything. That's why I always say you're not healed by the merits of your salvation. You're merit healed by the merits of your faith, if thou canst believe. Now, see, though I speak with tongues of man and angel, and have not charity, though he could do it, I'm nothing. So you see, you can't say nothing. Now, to my precious Methodist friends, I got two sitting right here and everywhere. I got them out here, many of them. The Methodist church used to believe back in its early primitive days that when a man got religion enough and sanctified to shout, he had it. The Pentecost said when he spoke with tongues, he had it. And nowadays they say if you got a healing ministry, you got it. <laughs> but there isn't any of... Listen, friends. Don't try to depend and seek sensations. Instead, rely upon realities. <laughs> See? Not sensations. Shouting's all right. Speaking in tongues is all right. Praising the Lord's all right. Faith for miracles is all right. All those things and those feelings. Some of them say, ooh, I felt it like a rushing wind. Others said, I felt fire in my soul. What? That doesn't make it right either way. It's what you are after you have received it, see? That's what counts, see? So you can't pin it to any certain sensation. Now, that's honestly the best that I know. <laughs> now, I may be wrong. If I am, then I misunderstand the Scripture. And if it's contrary, well, I don't mean to be contrary, see? But I'm just telling you my version of what I believe that is true. Now, we we'll take up a lot of our time here on this before we start into our regular service. And now, now we don't mention these things too often around the tabernacle. Sometimes, this has been the first time, I guess, for a long time, for maybe a year or two or something, and then maybe some of our people come in and they say, well, Brother Branham, uh, uh, I've, I've had stammering lips and I've done this and I've done that. And I said, well, all right. That's very good. Now, if you want to speak in an unknown tongue, I believe God will let you do it. But according to the Scriptures, you're still nothing until the Holy Spirit comes. Amen. Then after the Holy Spirit comes, then you can speak in tongues and have God will just take the nature that you are and cut it out for you and make you the best servant you can be. He might make you preach the gospel. He might make you have a gift of speaking in tongues. He might make you a prophet. He might give you a spirit of prophecy. He might it's hard to tell what he'd do for you, or he might do all those things for you. But the first thing is to be sure that by one, not sensation, but by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. And then the gifts come from that body. See, speaking in tongues and everything, what it is, if, if a Nazarene comes up to me, you say, Brother Brennan, now there's a Nazarene in the Methodist. They say they received the Holy Ghost when they shouted. They said they received the Holy Ghost. I'm not saying they didn't. But here's one thing that I watch. By the fruit, when truth is revealed, some of them turn against it bitterly. That's the devil. Then the fruit shows where it comes from. It shows they didn't get it. But those who are willing to walk in light receive word. Here some time ago, I was preaching down in Kentucky. And outside the meeting, there was a man who belonged to a church that believes the days of miracles is past. He was holding a lantern in his hand. And he said, I just waited for you, preacher. The old uncle and I, it's gone on now. I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm so-and-so. And I shook his hand. I said, I'm sure glad to meet you, my brother. And he said, uh, I just want to tell you that I believe that you're absolutely wrong. And I said, well, you've got a right to do that because you're an American. And uh, he said, well, you see, and we got, I said, wrong on what would you mean on the healing? I said, what about that little barefooted girl? They just walked up there yesterday, last night. Had a little baby. She wasn't over about 14 years old herself. Barefooted, little old, what you call that, gingham, calico, or 
some kind of a dress. I don't know about goods. And, and she had a little baby in her hand and she walked up to me and people sticking in the window. And this was the Methodist church, the White Hill Methodist church, just out of Berksville, Kentucky, where I was born. And she had this little baby. And I said, Sister, I'd ask anybody sick. And she walked up through that little bashful thing, her little head down. And she said, Yes, sir, my baby. And a little thing was going like that. I said, What's the matter with it, sister? She said, It's got the jerks. And I said, The jerks? Yes, sir. I said, How long has it had these jerks? And she said, Well, ever since it's been born, it's my not a year old. And I said, are you willing to let me hold that baby? Well, up there in the mountains, you have to kind of watch about that. And she said, yes, sir. She gave the little fellow my arm. And in my heart, it stood still. And then I said, God, if you're going to let me win these people, then do something for me now. And while I was holding my hand, it stopped jerking. I looked at it, set it up. My arms played with it. They grinned and laughed at me. I looked down at her and she raised her little head down, hair parted and hanging down her back and plaits on it. She raised her head up and the tears running down her little cheeks. Rough man standing there, whiskers on their face that long, the tears running down their cheeks. Looking around, I said, here's your baby, sister. Jesus Christ makes it well. And them old women begin to faint and fall on the floor and pour water in her face and fan them. And, and why? Well, I said, what did that? He said, Mr. Branham, I cannot accept anything until I thoroughly see it. I said, well, good idea, I suppose. But I said, I want to ask you where you live. He said, back over across the mountain your way. Go over home with me for supper tonight, and I'll give you some buttermilk and cornbread. I said, I'd like to go, and I'm really hungry. But I said, I can't do it. I got to go home with my uncle. And he said, well, I want to ask you. I want to ask you something. How do you know you're going to get home? He said, well, I'll just walk over that mountain. I said, can you see your home? He said, no. I said, then how do you know you're going to get there? He said, there's a path that leads. I said, but still, you can't see it. And you just told me you couldn't accept anything unless you've seen it thoroughly. Oh, he said, I'll just take the light and walk with the light. I said, that's just what I'm trying to get you to do. <laughs> just as a lantern gives light, you walk in the light as he is in the light. We'll get there all right. Though I don't see the end plainly, but I know it'll be there. Let us pray now. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to thee for the goodness of Jesus Christ who is the center of love. And uh, I used to think that you were angry with me, but Jesus loved me. But I find out now that Jesus is the very heart of God. So I, I know that you love me and, and suffered for me. And Father God, I pray for this world today and for our country. I pray, Lord, for forgiveness of my own mistakes. And for the mistakes of my people, the people that you've given me to shepherd over. And I pray that you'll bless them and every one of the people that's been in this little meeting that's asked questions or, or maybe I've said something contrary to what they believe. Lord, I can't explain it myself. I'm unable. But let, will you just let them know, Father, that in my heart what I mean Please, I pray you'll do that. Bless them together. Bless us now as we are waiting on your word just a few moments before baptismal service. Help us to speak that which is right. Help us to, in this message tonight, my throat being a little husky, I pray that you'll help me, dear God, and you will even heal the sick and afflicted that's in the midst of the people. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you will, for just the next few moments, let's turn over to the book of Romans, the sixth chapter. Oh, wait, I believe I got... Say, I got a whole lot more... Say, I'll just answer these Wednesday night, if that's all right. I'm done so late now. I didn't notice those laying there until just now. Now, 
Romans, the sixth chapter, let us read. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many as of us as were baptized unto Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death? Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. If I should take a text tonight for about 20 minutes, I would say this identification identified with Christ. You know, there is in the country today so many dissatisfied people. And it's amazing when you get around and find out so much dissatisfaction. People hardly know what they want to do. They come down the road at about 70 and 80 miles an hour in a 30 mile zone. Slide the brakes and turn around the corner and start up with such speed till they burn their tires half off to go to city block to sit and talk a while. Seems like people don't know what they do want. Some of them get so disturbed until they go down to the drugstore and purchase for themselves a bottle of arsenic or sulfuric acid or something and commit suicide. They find them laying dead. Some will turn their gas jets on in the room or set in their automobiles with a pipe for the carbon dioxide gas, trying to get away from life. Some of them will climb up to the bridge and write a little note and stick it on their coat and lay it down and plunge themselves to death in the river, jumping off of mountains, high towers. And some will take a pistol and put it up to their head and actually blow their brains out. They're just dissatisfied. The hospitals are full of dissatisfied people. The insane institutions are overrun, dissatisfied. They don't know what they do want. There seem to be something that they're reaching after, but they just never come to it. And also we find that homes, which is the backbone of the nation, and of the church. We find homes broke up and divorce courts just overrun with divorces. Juvenile delinquency of, of mothers leaving their little children with babysitters and, and taking off out to work and somewhere when their husbands got good jobs, but they're just not satisfied to be a mother and stay at home. They're not satisfied to dress like ladies. They, they want to dress like men. Man wants to be like women. And they just, there just seems to be something wrong somewhere and people are reaching for something and can't find it. That's a pitiful condition to be into. They've looked everywhere to find something to make themselves an example. We take the women of our days. 
They'll watch television until they see a certain movie star or she'll come out dressed in a certain way and all the women will want to dress like her or act like her. Make her example. Some pretty girls just in the bloom of life will try to pattern themselves and try to make some movie star an example that they should go by and finally they find themselves wound up in a cage of sin that they can't get out of. What a pity. Seeing them come into the meeting, tears running down their cheeks. But they're hunting for something. We take man. Man, you catch him on the street or in their business. The old man wants to be a teenager. You cut his hair off on the flat top and make a, a duck tail in the back. He wants to be a teenager. The teenager wants to be like one of these rock and roll kings. Where do they wind up? In sin and disgrace. Man seems to be unsatisfied. He's running everywhere. They'll take on, listen to the radio for jokes and things that these jokesters pull. And they'll go out and try to mimic or, or act like those people. You take the little boy on the street, how I know it, and he's got to be a paladin or a hop along Cassidy or, and the commercial world gets a hold of that and makes millions of dollars out of it. They got to be a Roy Rogers or a, a Mr. Dillon or, or some television program outfit. They're trying to impersonate that person. They've set them up as an example. They've taken them for their, their standard of life. What do they find at the end of the road? Those little fellows turn out to be gangsters and robbers. The women turn out to be prostitutes and, and street walking and, and delinquent people. Men turn out to be gamblers and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Churches try to impersonate the other church, the big church. We just seem to see there's no satisfaction among the people. What do they, what makes them do it? It's for a cause. It's a nature. God gave them that nature. They've got a nature that makes them want to uh, have something to identify themselves with. They must have something that they want to be like. An objective in life. They want to be a movie star or a cowboy or, or something on that idea. I was hearing on the radio coming home where some uh, great... Italian man at Denver was trying to play a hop along Cassidy something with a loaded gun. And instead of that, he's going to be a Chester the rest of his life. He shot his kneecap off. There you are. But they are trying to find something to identify themselves with. The reason they are doing it is because that there's something in them and God made them that. But God made them an example to be identified with. That was when He made Jesus Christ to become your Savior. That's the example. That's what people won't stop should want to be identified with Jesus. To be like Him. If all the little boys that wants to be 
hop along past the or, or some of these others or the little girls, the Annie Oakleys and so forth, if they only wanted to be like Jesus as much as they want to be like that, Amen. the Sunday schools would be running over everywhere. Amen. If the women that wants to be like some movie star would want to be like Jesus, the church, well, they'd never have to take up an offering. Certainly, God made a man to desire to have an example. And God gave him an example. Amen. That example is Jesus Christ. To be a, identified with Him. Now, if we would be more like Him, then there wouldn't be so many big shots in the world. There wouldn't be any hungry children in the world. There wouldn't be any whiskey or drinking or gambling. God gave us an example to be like, but we refused to be it. Now that's what's the matter with the world. They got the desire God has given that, but they've turned it the wrong way. It's time to return back and get on the right road and get facing Calvary. Nature proves it. Now, if people of this day with that great desire and great ambition to be like somebody for an example, if they took Christ as their example, then we would have, we could fire every police there was in the nation. Everybody would be meek and humble. Everybody would be kind, have brotherly love, one for the other. There would never be a divorce case ever played in our country. There would never be any sickness. We could even dismiss hospitals if everybody tried to make Jesus Christ their example. We wouldn't have need for nothing else. So that nature is in the man, but he puts it on the wrong thing. He makes some man. And you know the Bible said that we are cursed when we make flesh our stay. Yes. When you try to make flesh your stay or put your trust in flesh, the Bible said you are cursed. How well I know it's so easy to do it. Here's what causes a lot of it. Is our news stands full of vulgar magazines. Our homes are full of pinup pictures. Our news screens are never censored. They're wide open. You can crack any kind of jokes or, or do things that's terrible. There's no cleanness among us anymore. I know you think I'm awful hard on that. But it's somebody's got to be hard on it. <laughs> It's just got to be done. When I was a little boy, I read the book of Tars and the Apes. Mama had an old fur rug that Mrs. Wathen had given her, laid before the dresser. I cut that thing up and made me a Tarzan suit and slept in a tree for a week. I wanted to be Tarzan. Then when I read the book of the Lone Star Ranger, I rode her broomstick out being a hobby horse, trying to be the Lone Star Ranger. It's no more than what people will do. It's what you read, the music you listen to. Go into a restaurant and this old rock and roll. No wonder people are going crazy. That's enough to drive a human being crazy. But oh, I'll be thankful all through eternity to one day I read about Jesus. Amen. That satisfied me. I want to be like Him. That's my desire. To be able to turn the other cheek or go the second mile. To be able to forgive when the odds is all against you. Hold nothing against anybody, though they're mistreating you rightfully or wrongfully for your right doing. 
but still love them. That's the way I want to be. I want to be that kind of a person. I want to be able that when I'm riled upon, I would rile not back. That's the kind of a example that God gave us in Jesus Christ. We ought to be identified with Him. We are. How do you become identified with Him? You'd say, Brother Branham. Now to get, uh, you have to dress like the Hollywood stars and do these other things. But how do you become identified with Jesus Christ? First, you repent of what you already have done. And then you're identified with Him here in the pool. No doubt but what many will be identified with Him in a few minutes. In the pool you are identified with Him in baptism, for if we are buried in Christ, we are identified to His death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we are baptized. We go down into the water. Come back up to witness that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if we be planted in His likeness, in His death, uh, God gave us a promise. We'll be like Him in the resurrection. Yeah. Hallelujah. Identify yourself with some movie queen and see where you'll be. Identify yourself with some cowboy or some teenager and see where you'll be. But I challenge you tonight, identify yourself with Jesus Christ in His death and His resurrection and see where you'll be at the resurrection. For if we suffer with Him, we shall reign with Him. God has given us the promise. My whole desire is to be like Him. Take me, O Lord, and mold me and make me. Shape me over again like the prophet that went down to the potter's house. Break me up and remold me. In the Old Testament, when a man want to be identified at the house of God, he took the most innocent thing he could find, a lamb. And he knew the lamb was free from sin because it knew no sin. And he went and took the lamb and put his hand upon its head and confessed his sins. And by faith he transferred his sins on the lamb and the innocence of the lamb back on him. And then the lamb died because it was a sinner. And the man lived by an act of faith of obeying what God said. But what did he do? He went right back out of the temple with the same desire he had when he come in. Because when that blood cell is broken, which the life starts in one blood cell, and when that blood cell was broken, the life of the lamb would not coincide or come back into the human life because it was an animal life. The man went out with the same desire he had. So therefore he committed sins continually all the time again. But there come a time when God made us an example. And He gave us the Lord Jesus. And when a sinner puts his hands upon his precious head and confesses his sins and his sins is transformed or transformed from the sinner to Jesus and the innocence of Jesus is transferred by the Holy Ghost back into that person. He's a new creature in Christ. Hallelujah. Glory. That's where I want to be identified. The Bible said, He knowing no sin was made sin for us. The reason He suffered was for our sins. And it's no more than what is right. No more than our duties to look at these things and see at these desires that we have that God put in us to create a, in us to make us to want to be like Him. And now if you can see it by faith before the real desire ever strikes you, come forward, be identified with Him in baptism. And then as you're planted in the likeness of His death, 
you shall also share in his likeness in the resurrection. For when he come from the grave, he was the same Jesus that went into the grave. And if we be in Christ, how do we get in? By Holy Spirit baptism. At that day we'll come forth and share in his resurrection. Amen. There used to be a little song that I used to sing years ago. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, on earth I long to be like Him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, I only ask to be like Him. From Bethlehem's manger came forth a stranger, a stranger to the world. On earth I long to be like Him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, I only ask to be like Him. Share in His meekness. You'll share also in His power. Share in His obedience. And you'll share in His resurrection. Do as God says do. In my heart, the greatest thing that I could think of is to be like Jesus Christ, to be identified with Him. That's why I baptize the people in the name of Jesus Christ because He is our identification. Amen. We pack the identification. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of Jesus Christ, giving praise to God for it. And we are identified with Him in baptism. Tonight we're going to baptize just in a few minutes. People here in the room, that's sure to be baptized. And if there's any desire in your heart that you want, have any great worldly ambitions, repent of them right now. Tell God you're sorry that you wanted to be uh, some great worldly person. Say, Lord, my complete ambition is to be like Jesus. Come meekly, humbly. Then when you put your hands up on his head and by faith confess your sins, Say, Lord, I'm sorry I've done it. Then what will happen? God will transfer all your guilt over on Him and take His innocence and put it back on you and you stand justified in the presence of God because you believed on Jesus Christ, His Son. What a plan of salvation. Amen. Then you'll share in His glory. The goodness of God will come into your heart. The power of His resurrection will make you a new person. It will satisfy ever long. When I was a boy, I tried to do everything. And I, I'd done everything I was big enough to do and a lot of things I wasn't big enough to do. I tried. I used to love, I do love to hunt. I thought that was it. I thought if I, my daddy was a rider. And I thought if I could ever get west and break their horses. A brother, one time way back up down in the mountains in Arizona, bringing down a herd of cattle one night, I was sitting there and a boy named Slim had an old comb with a piece of paper over it. He was playing and another fellow sitting there from Texas with the guitar strumming. And they come on to a hymn. I had my saddle off the horse, laying down my head, used it for a pillar and my blanket up all over me there, still with my boots on, a pair of spurs holding me up off the ground. And he began to strum down at the cross where my Savior died. Down thou for cleansing from sin, I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I tried to pull the blanket up and stop my ears up. I look up the stars hanging low in them. Whispering pines in the mountains seemed to cry, Adam, where art thou? Oh, cattle raising was a second thing. I wanted to find God. Way back out there, kicked up on a pair of those spurs. I said, sir, I don't know who you are, but don't punish me until I can find the real thing. Two days after that, down in the city, sitting there in a after a few days after that, after the roundup, I was sitting there on a little old park bench. A little Spanish girl come by. And I was sitting there thinking about God. 
What could it be? And the little girl come by and me, just about an eighteen year old boy. She dropped her handkerchief and walked by. I said, Woman, you dropped your handkerchief. Just the thoughts of God have changed my desire. A uh, poor Irish heart was a hunger. I wanted something, something that satisfied. God has given me the privilege of hunting the world over Africa, India, across the mountains, Canada, on some of the greatest trips and caught world records. It's all all right, but there's nothing that will take the place of that power of the living God. <laughs> when I get there, I love the mountains. I love the sunsets. I just take down time a horse and take up top the mountains and stay a couple days. Just watching the sun rise and go down, hearing the eagle scream. It's good. I love to be there. But brother, my heart begins to thump and to beat when I think of unclean, unclean, the evil spirit tore him. All is well when Jesus comes to stay. I begin to think of the sick people in that call. And there's something within me cries out, get out of these mountains right quick. Get down there to the people. I want to identify myself as his servant among his people. Oh, how I love to identify myself with him. Then in regards to that, he comes back among us and identifies himself with us. He's here tonight, friends. It's time now for the baptismal service to start in about ten minutes. And I want to say this one thing. Before we do it, before we start it, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Just a lot of comments I want to say, but I don't have the time. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has identified Himself in His Word. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, identified Himself in the meeting this morning. Amen. By giving discernment, Amen. identifies himself and bringing a sinner from the ruts of sin to a new man, a new creature. Take the lowest of woman or the lowest of man, drunkard, alcoholic, and whatever it is, and straighten them up and clean them up and make a gentleman or a lady out of them. That's my Lord. Take the man that's sick and afflicted and no hope for him. And raise him up to a new life again. Then appear into our midst and identify himself as the same Jesus to know the very thoughts of our heart. Stand in our midst in his people. God in his people identifying himself. He's here now. That same Holy Spirit. Before we start that meeting in here for the baptism, my brother's making ready. I wonder if this, I wonder if there's any in here that didn't get prayed for this morning and you're sick. Let's see your hand. Go up. Put up your hands if you're sick and needy and you did not get prayed for this morning. No prayer cards or nothing, just, just sick and afflicted. All right. Let's bow our heads just a moment. Lord, with this tightened throat, rusty voice, oh, I pray that you will sink into the heart, the seed anyhow, into the people's heart that we must be identified with you. For it's an old proverb here on earth, the bird is known by his feathers, and the man is known by the company he keeps. And dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you will be our company. Lord, let us have you if it costs everything that we have on this earth. Let us be identified as that man really lives with God. His company is God. Let it be said like it was with Peter and John after they had passed through the gate called Beautiful and said, I don't have any money, but 
What I do have, I'll give you. And the crippled man was made well. And when before the course, the people said they perceived they were ignorant and unlearned. They had no education, but they did perceive that they had been identified with the right kind of company. They had been with Jesus. God, that's my heart's desire. To be identified with you as one of your servants. As one who loves you. One who would be true to you and keep the sayings of your book and do all that I know to do that's right. Now, Father, will you again tonight identify yourself among us that the people might know that this is just not something, oh, some special time or, or something on that order, Lord. Let it be known tonight that you're the same God that was here this morning. Amen. You have the same power and the same of the same things that you did this morning, you can do again tonight. You promised that they'd be in the last days. Many here couldn't perceive enough faith. We pray that you'll give them faith now. And let thy spirit be identified among us. For you said, the works that I do shall he also that believeth on me. Amen. So I pray, God, that you'll identify that you are here with us tonight and are still love us. And you want every person in here that hasn't been baptized to come and be identified with you that they too might be partakers of this wonderful grace that can be transferred from us to Him and from Him to us, our guilt to Him and His grace to us. Grant it, Lord. Hear our prayers as we ask in the name of Jesus, thy Son. Amen. We are standing in the shadow of the just justice of God. Every time that two or three are gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ, He promised He'd be in their midst. Amen. Now, I don't know. I guess part of the prayer cards is taken up. Some of you may still have some. Many of you don't have prayer cards. It doesn't matter. Whether you have or whether you have not, if you're sick, you're sick. And if this God who wrote this Bible, do you solemnly believe in Him? Amen. Amen. If he shall return again into our midst to prove himself besides of the preaching of the word that he's here, convincing sinners that he's here, if he is sure to heal the sick and would reveal the cause as he did when he was here on earth, would you gladly accept your healing if you will raise your hand? Just anywhere we ain't go to, we ain't got no, I will know what prayer cards you're giving and we're not going to have prayer cards. Just you pray. And you believe. And if he will do so and will identify himself, you should be ashamed not to identify yourself with him then. You should do it. Now here is a straight challenge. In the church this morning we gave prayer cards and called them to the altar and prayed for them and the Holy Spirit shook with such a great time until I felt them pull me on the sides. It was time to go because I was weak. And now here I'm saying, you that don't have prayer cards or whatever you are sitting out there in the audience, you challenge, I challenge you to do this, to believe that the story I've told you of Jesus Christ is truth. And you pray if you're sick. No matter, this morning I tried to see if I could find people that wasn't with the tabernacle. Tonight, I don't care where you're from. You just pray. Amen. And then if that great Holy Spirit of God that we have the picture of there, if He will come into this midst, you've heard me preach it so much that He promised the things that He would do that, and then when He was on earth, when He come back into our flesh, he would do the same thing. Now, if you're sick, pray. Challenge you. Challenge God.
say, God, Brother Branham don't know me. He knows nothing about me. But if you just let him turn to me and let me touch your garment, then you speak, I'll know that you're in connection with this church. That church is the believers. Then I'll know that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you pray. I just feel led to do that. I don't know why I did. But I feel led to do it. Now if you'll raise your hand. Right here, looking at me, is the little woman that had her hand up like this praying just a few minutes ago. And she's praying for somebody else besides herself. I've never seen the woman in my life as I know of. She looked total stranger to me. But she's praying for her daughter for an, about an operation. You're not even from this country. You're from Texas. That's thus saith the Lord. Do you have a prayer card? You don't. Well, you don't need one. Believe with all your heart. How did I know what you were praying about? Can't you see the God of heaven reveals the secrets of the heart? Didn't Daniel say that in his day? God reveals the secrets of the heart. There's a lady sitting next to you there. She was so happy about it. She had heart trouble, and she wants to be prayed for. So if you'll just lay your hand over on her. All right. Now you go back to Chicago and be made well. <laughs> I don't know that woman either. know nothing of her. But God knows you. See, He's making Himself identified with us. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. This little Jewish woman sitting here, she is praying too. That's right. You was praying for me to say something to you. I seen your troubles this morning, but I just didn't call it. But them feet you've been bothered about is going to get well. So don't you worry. Uh, uh. Oh, thank the Lord. Hallelujah. You believe too? Little lady sitting here? You believe me to be his prophet or his servant? I don't know you. God knows you. But if he is God's spirit with us, then he'll do like Jesus did. You were praying, and it seems like I was attracted to you. There's the angel of the Lord, Barn. <laughs> if you'll believe, your heart trouble will cease. Arthritis. Your name is Miss Wisdom. That's right. You go back and be well, Miss Wisdom. Hallelujah. I've never seen the woman in my life. But he's God. Yeah. If you'll just believe it. Here. Look here. See that little lady saying there's her hand up like this to your mouth? There's, can't you see that light hanging right above the woman there? Now look, comes right down towards her. I see it breaking. She's got trouble with the liver. Bother the liver trouble. It's a gallbladder trouble. Well, you're Mrs. Palmer. That's it. I remember now who I didn't see. It's just a vision. I see you sitting by Brother Palmer. That's right, sister. Now you go and be well. Believe with all your heart. There's a little lady sitting behind her too that looked up kind of astonished right behind her. You think the tonsil trouble of those two children will leave it, sister? And you also? And go on your road home and rejoice and be happy. Put your hand over on the babies, both of them with those troubles and your trouble left also. Amen. You're healed in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
All of you, you'll get well, be well. Can you see the living God lives today? He's just as great anywhere, isn't he? Don't you want to be identified with him? Certainly you do. Sure you want to. Now let us bow our heads just a moment before I, it weakens me so much. How many wants to be remembered in prayer just now saying, God, be merciful to me. I now want to believe the Lord Jesus. I, I want all my troubles straightened out now. God be with you. Lord, who brought again Jesus from the dead, the God of heaven, I pray thee in their behalf that this will be the hour that they'll believe. Come forward if they've never did it before and be identified with Jesus Christ here in this pool tonight. For the Scripture said that if we are buried with Him unto baptism and share with Him in His death, we'll also share in the resurrection with Him. That is a promise in the great St. Peter of old said, For us to repent and to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and we shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All this week, here sits my daughter-in-law, Lord, little Lois, hungering and thirsting and fasting and waiting. There sits my sister back down here, hungering and thirsting and fasting and waiting. Oh, Lord, send the Holy Ghost just now somehow into this building and strike their soul to the power of the resurrection. And may they rise to their feet in the resurrection power and be identified with Jesus Christ in His resurrection. Grant it, Lord. Forgive every sin. Omit everything that's wrong, Father. And give us Thy grace as we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Heal all the sick and the afflicted. Lord, You're here. You're God. You, you prove Yourself God. And we pray that knowing the nature of your spirit, that you performed a few things and then disappeared from them, was gone somewhere else and into another city and out and gone. But you left the mark behind that the living God lived. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that, you, that this has been an impression upon the people's hearts that they'll never forget that the Holy Spirit is present to heal and to save and to fill with His goodness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, how many here was to be baptized? Will you raise your hand? It's got your things ready. You can make ready then for the waters just in a few moments. And now, while we're waiting on the Holy Spirit just for a few moments, how many here has not received the Holy Ghost as yet and desiring, praying, earnestly receive the Holy Ghost? Teddy, if you will, or some of you to the piano right away. We're going to sing some hymns just now while the women that's going to make ready for baptism go over in this room and the man go over in this room that's making ready for baptism while we get ready to, for the event. And then we're going to be waiting on the Holy Spirit to come to us and to reveal to us the things that He wants us to do. Then we'll turn the lights out in the main auditorium. The minister will be into the waters of uh, here. And then we will, we will have this ceremony of the baptizing. Just a moment, just before you turn the light out, Brother Evan, I want to read some Scripture while we're waiting just for a moment, if you will. While they begin to make ready, I'd like to read some Scripture here. How many believes that God is infinite? Sure, He's here right now. The only thing you have to do to receive the Holy Ghost is rise and accept Him. Why, His power is proven that He's here. How could we have one shadow of doubt? His blessed Holy Presence is bathing our soul. I feel like I could scream to the top of my voice. Of His goodness and His mercy endureth forever and ever. He's here. My heart is burning and filled with joy and exceeding gladness because of His presence. Before they shall turn the lights, I want to read out of Acts, the first chapter. 
And I believe that every man, minister, or person in your evangelist or want more, that there will be this, that God is infinite. God cannot do one thing one way and then turn around and do, this, do, the, do it another way. He's got to do it the same way every time, hasn't He? This was the proclamation that went forth from God. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. What kind of signs did he do to prove he was Messiah? By knowing the thoughts in their hearts. Is that right? What Peter said, by signs and wonders, God proved that he was with him. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel, the foreknowledge of God, ye have taken him by wicked hands, you've crucified and slain him, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David spake concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He's on my right hand, and I shall not be moved. Wherefore did all my heart rejoice, and my tongue was made glad? Moreover, my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the way of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with my countenances. Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would, ra he would raise up Christ to set on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, Neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up. Wherefore, we are witnesses. Oh, that just thrills me. We still are his witness. He was raised up from the dead. He lives tonight. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted in heaven, received a of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, He has shed forth this which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into heaven, but he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Set thou on my right hand, till I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, what language was he speaking in? All those languages of the world heard him. Now, when they, the peoples, heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Man and brethren, what shall we do? A while ago, they were crazy to them. Now, after that mighty sermon that was going forth to every nation standing there, Man and brethren, what can we do? Then come the prescription. Then, answer, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, to your children, and to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this onward generation. If that ain't the same gospel we're preaching today, save yourselves from this onward generation. Many signs and wonders being wrought, the presence of Jesus Christ showing himself alive. And the same baptism that was commissioned right here is commissioned right here at the pulpit, too, tonight. Then they that gladly receive his word were baptized and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. Dear God, those the rooms are standing full 
of people being identified in baptism with you. I pray thee, Lord, in their stead, that if you will just kindly, Lord, at this hour, when they come from the water, may there be something happen to them, that their souls will be filled with the Holy Ghost. May they come forth and leave the water, go forth to manifest you in preaching the gospel, teaching the Sunday schools, speaking with tongues, interpreting tongues, doing signs, wonders, and miracles, and above everything, the love of God burning in their souls with meekness and gentleness and patience and humbleness. Lord, I commit them to you. They are the trophies of this revival. And I pray that you will keep them in your care. And someday, as I'm standing here praying over your Bible, after I preach from it, and declare with all my heart what I think to be the truth as you will reveal it to me. And Lord, we're waiting on their baptism just as we're all in the audience here waiting for the resurrection. And someday, Lord, while we're standing together in heavenly places, may there come a sound from heaven, the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. May we be caught up with Him to meet the Lord in the air and forever be with Him. Grant it, Father, keep us healthy and happy and full of zeal. We do not ask for money. We do not ask for easy things. We just ask to be like Jesus. We want to be identified with Him. But the kind of spirit that was in Him, meek, gentle, always about the Father's business. Lord, in the closing hour of this revival and this identification of many of the precious people, I continue to identify Yourself by giving them the Holy Ghost. Grant it, Father. Bless this little tabernacle. Bless every minister, every person that's attended it, every church that's been here. Lord, I pray that You'll send a revival in every church throughout the world. And we'll see them come together with one heart and one accord for the rapture and grace of Jesus Christ to be given among us. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Now the lights will be out in the main auditorium for a while. These handkerchiefs have been prayed over. And now the lights will be out for just a short time. And then, and then uh, just be quiet. And the minister will be baptizing just one right after the other. So we get that done. Now, if everyone can see, now, uh, now one microphone, pull that back down to the bottom of the I can go to the recorder here too. This is to the recorder. Why he they can hear it.
our mutual news which is in the gospel. Let's give you the Jesus. Yes. Have your way now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 